All right. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, thank you for the chance to speak here. Happy to, uh, to contribute a view of what we've been doing at Viasat. So I work at uh, Viasat. That's a um, uh, company that designs, deploys, and operates uh, high-capacity communication satellites. I work there as a software developer. So I work with um, a lot of distributed systems. I, I kind of like to think maybe there's some of the more highly distributed systems that you might encounter. Um, so yeah, so we're WASH in distributed systems, and um, I've taken to using TLA Plus to, to model those. And I mean, I could recite the cliche that you hear. Um, at a minimum, it, you know, it refines your thinking. And then at a maximum, you, 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 know, you use model checker and you find uh, problems. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan. I think um, it's a tool that uh, you know, we should really uh, work to get in our toolbox. And so for me, it, I found it very natural that as I use TLA Plus, it, it bleeds over into advocacy really quick. And so I kind of thought about, like, why is that? And I, this is my thought of, of why it is. It's because, you know, I, I, I want other systems that I'm interacting with to also have specs so I can read them and understand them. And um, I want other people to be able to read my specs and to, to understand those. So um, I think that's really the way I'll frame this is um, I think of the tool I'm about to show um, from, the, from a perspective of adv advocacy that is um, kind of fostering adoption of, of TLA Plus as a tool. Um, not some esoteric tool that you know, only a few specialists reach for, but as a, as a tool that's much closer at hand than that. So when I think about like, the process somebody would go through in terms of adapt, adopting TLA Plus, this is the way I think of it. First, you, you become aware of it. Uh, and, uh, and maybe at some point, you kind of like drink, you become convinced, oh, it's a silver bullet, right? Like, oh, I could just sprinkle this in, and it'll make all my problems go away. And of course, it's not that, right? It's a, it's a, a very focused tool at hand. It's not a silver bullet. But you need to be aware of the tool. Um, and then you need to become comfortable in using the tool, just the mechanics of you know, how do you make it work and how do, how do you do what you need to do. And I think really the place we want to get to is um, what was mentioned in the last talk, right? There's kind of this art to doing, uh, to writing these specs, of thinking at the right level and, and, and really focusing on, on what the important parts are. So what I'm focused on right now is I want to get across the, kind of this valley of th this ease of use. I want to focus on how do we make the, 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 um, the system or the tools more accessible to users. So um, I am a developer. I'm a software developer. I'm not a mathematician, not a computer scientist. I'm a, I'm a practitioner. And so for me, I think of it from a developer's perspective of how do we make, how, how do we provide more affordances that developers are used to having when they're, when they're doing these kind of activities. Um, and then how do we really, I think there's a way we can play to developers' strengths. Um, and that is to bring the skills to bear that they have developed over the years and bring them to bear in writing TLA plus specifications. So that's kind of the premise uh, behind the system we come up with called SALT. Um, so the idea is that you can um, write TLA plus expressions uh, or formulas in S expressions. And then once you do that, uh, we've built some tools that you can use to do things like to evaluate them, to simplify them, simulate them, and transpile them. And, and I'll talk about in detail what, what these mean. So um, it kind of starts with, uh, I'm trying to like, form a, a problem statement here of, of why are we doing this. So for me, um, you know, I wasn't nominated to be the spokesman for developers, so this is really kind of like what I want. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's kind of convenient to talk about what do developers want. So, uh, what do developers want? So I would submit that uh, you know, we want interactivity. This is something we're used to kind of in our modern world of development. And so for me, that means I want to do things like enter a TLA plus formula or expression, and I want the computer to like, tell me, oh, this is what that uh, evaluates to. Um, you know, in particular, as you're learning the language, I think even once I know a language, I still kind of I want to pick it up and I want to get it in my hand. Um, to, to interact with it. And it's a way of using the computer to augment my, my thought process ar around what I'm doing. Uh, a common way that I've seen that realized is via this concept called a REPL. I don't know how widespread that term is, but in the circles I run in, this is very well known. The idea is, um, yeah, it stands for, you know, there's this loop that the computer is running. It's reading what you type, it's evaluating it, it's printing out the result, and then it prompts you for what are you going to say next. Um, there's a variety of languages that, that give you this facility. Um, and so I'll use this notation kind of throughout the talk where I'll type an expression and then I'll have this, um, this indicator which <laughs> unfortunately collides with the TLA plus operator. It's not that. But anyway, this, uh, this is like uh, you're at a command prompt. You type 1 plus 1 and then the REPL or whatever it responds and tells you, oh, that evaluates to 2. Um, so for me as a developer, when I'm working in a language that supports a REPL, this is like the way I think of it. It's not like I wrote some code and it's ASCII and oh, now it's going to be compiled and then eventually the program will run but rather it's an environment where um, there's a process that's running 
that has loaded in all of my code, and now I'm inside of that process. So when I type things to it, I'm talking to that process. So I can touch it, I can manipulate it, I can look at it, I can change things. Um, this is the kind of, of interactive development experience that, that I'm looking for uh, out of my tools today. So beyond that, I'm looking for the ability to do incremental coding. So I'm really leery of the idea, although sometimes it works, right? Sometimes you have an idea, you go type it all up, and then you run it, and it works, and you're like, wow, that, there must be something wrong, right? Uh, how could it work? Right? That's, that doesn't happen. But that's not usually, I mean, that's kind of fun when it happens, but not usually the way it is. Usually it's, um, you choose some layer, either the bottom or the top or the, the middle, and you, you like start working on a part of it, and then you're kind of growing it, and you're organically growing it, and, and as you grow it, you're refining your understanding of the problem space and, and your solution and your design. And so you're, you're incrementally laying down, um, in this case, I want to incrementally lay down a specification. So for me, this is my mental model of what a TLA plus, TLA plus specification looks like. For me, it's kind of like bottom up in this fashion. So like at the foundation, writing the spec, of, there's some constants that kind of define the scope of your world. Um, and then you have assumptions, which are predicates um, applied to those. Um, you build up, you define your states, your, or your variables that define your state, you make an initialization predicate that says, here's what initialization states look like, here's your actions and your next that shows how you change things, um, and then obviously invariants that, that apply to the, those different levels. So, um, and then helpers off on the left, and then finally at the top, like you've got this whole machine set up, and now you can talk about overall behaviors, and you can define um, you know, temporal properties that, that govern um, correct behavior. So for me, uh, I think of this as kind of a layered approach where, like I said, I want to like, choose a layer and start working on that and flesh it out and, and get feedback to make sure it's working. Um, the next thing I'm looking for uh, uh, from my tools is the ability to support refactoring. Um, so if this isn't a term you're familiar with, it's like you have uh, a formula or you have some code that uh, does what you want, but now you realize you'd like to change the structure. So this is a way to change, uh, a term for changing the structure of, the, of your formula without actually changing the behavior. Um, it's pretty well established practice in the development world today and it's something I want to bring to uh, my, my experience in, in writing specifications. Um, yeah, so different people have different thoughts on this. I'm of the opinion that I'm, I, I, I'm just not inclined to spend my time manually formatting code at this point in my life. So um, I, I, uh, I want a tool that's going to auto format it for me. So, um, and I'm really not going to belabor this point at all, but um, I think to ease the adoption, um, there's communities we could go after where if we could um, have a more familiar syntax, uh, we, could, we could benefit from that. And I, I, I really don't want to get into a lot of syntactic discussions, but I felt like I had to put this in here because as I kind of looked at what we're doing, this is a part of it. Um, so I wanted to at least mention it. So now I think with that kind of preface, we can talk about what problem are we trying to solve. So for me, this is the problem. I want to facilitate developers' use of TLA, TLA Plus by providing you know, these, these things that I just talked about. Um, and uh, truly, like, I would love to hear about other approaches, or maybe there's even existing tools that I'm ignorant of that would give me some of these things. So um, you know, I don't claim to have like, the final ultimate answer, but merely this is my kind of groping towards uh, towards uh, some improvement or some solution. So, so this is the problem we have laid out for us for this system that, that I'm now going to talk about, the SALT system. So, um, Specific goals. Um, I really want to bring developers to TLA+. So I don't want to create an alternate thing that kind of obscures the TLA+, concepts. I want them to understand. I think it's very important that they understand the TLA+, concepts. Um, I want to leverage the existing tool sets, like you know, we talked about in the last talk. Um, so I want to leverage the TLC model checker. I don't have any interest in creating my own. Sort of. Okay, non-goals. Uh, so I, I'd like to avoid introducing new concepts. So the things in Salt, I want to map one to mo one to one as much as possible to TLA plus. Um, I'm actually not interested in uh, imperative solutions. So. I'm actually not a fan of saying, oh, we need to go with an imperative, like a plus cal solution, because that's how we reach developers. Um, I've sort of uh, kind of transitioned to more of a functional programming style, and so I think there's a lot of benefit in uh, kind of uh, continuing to promote that. So I'm not looking for imperative programming. Um, I'm really not doing a lot with temporal operators at all. Like, uh, I'm not trying to, to tackle that problem. It's really um, much more focused on just getting all the various predicates and relations right. Um, yeah, and so I'm uh, distinctly not trying to do cogen. So these, this is that slide I showed before. So these highlighted areas, 
these are the areas where I want to bring to bear like those five things I talked about, incremental development, interactive development. I want to bring that to bear on, on this parts of the system and then really leverage the TLC model checker for uh, verifying the temporal properties once I've, I've done all this. So if we step back, let's think about uh, a language here. So, um, yeah, so uh, we want to, let's consider a language that has a mathematical view of the world. It doesn't embrace like the traditional static typing. You know, it's got sets as this first order, you know, this primary data structure, you know, they look something like that. Uh, it's really focused on concurrent systems. So you can, you know, it's focused on representing state with immutable data, data that never changes. Um, no side effects. Uh, we're really thinking carefully about, okay, how does our state change and make sure we're modeling these atomic steps to, to change states. Uh, we've got a way to do syntactic substitution. Um, and then really in the end, what formal methods are all about, right, is we want to write uh, this quote unquote code in such a way that uh, the semantics are precisely defined enough that it can be mechanically manipulated. So um, I'm sure you all know the, the language uh, that we're talking about here. So um, I'm talking about closure. Um, so this is uh, a language which I don't know, who here is, knows about closure or knows Oh, wow. Okay, awesome. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I don't want to overstate this point. I don't think they're equivalent languages. I, I don't think it's a competitor. I don't think anything like that. What I'm trying to really point out is um, for people that uh, have been living in the closure space, we are primed for doing TLA+, because many of the foundational ideas that are really important in TLA+, we've already been exposed to. We've already, you know, we've already um, adopted th those ways of thinking. So for me, that's where it comes down to, for SALT, I'm going after the closure community. Um, I'm trying to leverage their investment that they've made in learning closure and let them know that, hey, there's this other tool that's close at hand, this TLA Plus, that's really powerful and, and we, can, we can get it within your reach um, in a natural way. So closure, for those of you who don't know, real quick, it's a, a modern implementation of a LISP. Uh, it primarily runs on the Java Virtual Machine, although there's other targets like Closure Skip, Closure Script. Oh, what am I trying to say? Uh, JavaScript and the um, the Common Language Runtime from our host Microsoft. Um, so yeah, so Closure has a REPL. So we'll get that out of the way real quick. That whole interactive way of coding that that's uh, kind of at the forefront of how you work with uh, with Closure. Um, and uh, I'm not going to really do it justice, but if, you, if you're not familiar with uh, Closure or Lisp, so the, the core idea is that you express uh, data and, and your code as uh, these trees that are called S expressions. So um, you, it's basically there's a list of, in, delimited by parentheses, one, two, these number one, two, three, and you can have nested lists. And then sort of the trick of Lisp is, oh, your code is actually just a list. And so it understands, um, you know, if it goes to evaluate a... Uh, a list, it looks at the first item and says, oh, I'm going to apply that function to, to these parameters. So it's function application there. Um, so if you look at uh, compare closure to TLA+, plus, you look at the primitives, numbers, strings, booleans, you know, very similar. We've got symbols, right? You introduce a symbol, at, let x. Um, a lot of similarities there. Uh, this is a rundown of how closure data structures uh, equate to TLA+, plus data structures. So we're really close on the set syntax. Um, commas are actually optional white space in closure. So you could add a comma there to make it a little closer if you liked. Uh, but of course, it's got the hash at the front. Uh, tuples in TLA plus are probably vectors in closure. Um, the idea of a function in TLA plus maps very well to the idea of a map in closure. So that's a map that's saying uh, mapping the value 1 to 10 and the value 2 to 20. So it's to be read as a sequence of pairs. Um, yeah, it's got anonymous functions there at the end. So uh, a lot of similarities. Uh, when it comes to logic, um, so now this is getting into what we've done with SALT. So this is beyond uh, closure. You see like the capital A and the capital E uh, functions here. So um, yeah, so if you're going to add two things together in closure, of course that equates to the, the TLA plus code on the right. If you want to say for all x uh, in this set, 1, 2, 3, is x greater than 2, that's how you'd say it in TLA+. Plus. It's kind of a common idiom in closure to have uh, tuples to establish bindings uh, in your code between symbols and, and values. Um, so I'm not 
able in this time slot, obviously, to, obviously, to do a full uh, tutorial on the language, but I wanted to give you a feel for it. Um, so the um, TLA plus, you capture like formulas that you're going to use as, as operators. Um, enclosure, uh, the decision here for salt was to model that as functions. In a way, technically, in TLA plus, they're more like macros enclosure, doing syntactic substitution. But I think in practice, uh, the syntax and some of the affordances we have with functions make it a more natural fit. Um, and it doesn't turn out uh, to, to break the semantics because we actually never evaluate those functions unless we have all the variables uh, defined. And at that point, it's moot whether you're substituting you know, syntactically or just the result. Um, at least that's my conclusion. If, if anyone knows of a case where it's different, I, I'd love to hear about it. So. Uh, you, you can, in TLA plus, you can define recursive uh, operators. So you'd say it's recursive. Of course, in closure, uh, you can do the same. So if you define this function add, um, then you can call yourself. You, know, you don't have to declare it, but you can call yourself. Uh, higher order operators, you, know, you can pass in a function or an operator to an operator in TLA plus. Um, you can pass in a function to a function in closure and call it. So no big surprises. So all in all, um, that's probably pretty small, but I, I wanted to just not, I'm not going to talk about all this, but I'm going to talk about like the naming scheme. Um, and this sort of shows how we're, we're bridging the gap and how we're kind of melding these two worlds of closure and TLA+. Plus. So at the top are, are straight up closure identifiers. So if you're a closure developer, you're probably familiar with those. At the bottom are the kind of the pure TLA plus operators that we've just co-opted and made part of the SALT language. And then in the middle are kind of, uh, kind of the bridge. So, uh, and you notice they're, they're, they're named pretty consistently. So, um, you know, these have TLA plus names, those have closure names, and then the ones in the middle have kind of this extra identifier at the end to kind of distinguish what part of the world you're in. Um, so some of the um, operators existed in TLA plus, but the semantics were, or existed in closure, but were, the semantics were a little bit off to map to TLA plus. So when we changed the semantics of an existing closure op uh, function, we, we added an asterisk. And then there's some things that we just added that aren't, they don't exist in either, but they're necessary to bridge, and so those have this, this dash um, at the end of the name. All right, so it's all based around um, S expressions, which I think are a very good fit for formal methods because as I said earlier, one of the central ideas to me of formal methods is to um, capture your formulas in a very, with very well-defined semantics so that you can mechanically manipulate them. And S expressions are code represented as data. And so they are right there ready to be manipulated as data. And so we have, uh, we've implemented these four operators that you can do on them to, to manipulate them. Um, and getting back to what I talked about earlier with some of the uh, affordances for developers, um, if you're using closure, using S expressions, our, our editors understand them. So when you go in to edit like a source file, you're not just editing ASCII text, you're editing uh, an abstract syntax tree, right? You're editing a tree and the editor understands that. So you've got keystrokes and things that allow you to manipulate that as a tree, which is, um, you know, a, a very powerful thing to use. All right, so this is now getting to an actual specification written in SALT. Um, if you're used to closure, up at the top, uh, it's a standard namespace uh, declaration clock. That'll translate into just a module named clock in TLA+. And then we require to bring in uh, the SALT language itself. If there were other standard uh, TLA+, modules that we were referencing, we could reference them there, there as well. Uh, but this example doesn't. So. This is an example you may have seen in some of the TLA plus training materials. It's just a clock. So there's one variable called clock. And as our, um, our predicate here for our initial state says, uh, you know, contains is the closure operator asking, is this is a value in a given set? So this is saying, does the set with, with zero and one in it, does it contain the value of clock? Which means clock must be either zero or one for your initial state. So this is, um, this is salt code, this is closure code. You can type this into your closure REPL um, and it will evaluate it or into a buffer that is evaluated into your closure REPL. And um, then now I, I was talking about these things you can do with it. So we've got a function called evaluate. So you can call salt evaluate on it. And salt evaluate takes three parameters. It takes uh, a map of uh, all the constants that you want to bind values for. Uh, it takes a map of all the variables, all the state that you want to bind var values for, and then a body of something you want to evaluate in that context. So for example, given that previous definition of uh, clock and init, I can ask salt to evaluate uh, this thing that has no constants, because there's none defined, so that's an empty map. 
Um, and then there's this map that binds uh, the value zero to the variable clock, or to the symbol clock, I guess. And then it invokes that my init function. Um, and so it's just going to evaluate that. And in this case, it actually ends up going to the closure evaluator. And um, all the variables are bound. So it can simply evaluate that, and that evaluates to true. So it tells me that uh, the current value of clock, which is 0, is in fact contained in the set 0 or 1. I ask it for 1, and it tells me, yes, that's, that's true as well. So obviously, this is a, uh, a trivial example, uh, and there wouldn't be a lot of like, value in interactively asking this. Uh, but you can imagine, you know, once you, you get more complicated things, you'd like to be able to uh, ask the computer if it means what you think it means. And so here I can ask it if I set clock to 2 and I run the init function, does it still evaluate to true? And of course, no, it doesn't. So it evaluates to false at this point. So now I added a, uh, another function here to my specification. I added a, a tick function. So this is what will take us to our next states, or defines valid next states given a current state. Uh, so there's two branches here. Um, either the clock starts out at 0, and uh, then the clock prime would be 1, or it starts out at 1, and then the, the new value is 0. So in, in either of those cases, uh, tick should evaluate to true, and anything else, it should evaluate to false. So again, I can ask salt to evaluate that, and now I define two uh, variables in my state map, clock and clock prime, and I, call, I ask is tick, what is the value of tick, and it says it's true. Uh, if I set both clock and clock prime to zero, it says false. That's not, that's not valid. So um, as we're building these up, like you could interactively imagine like typing these into a buffer and evaluating them. But of course, the practice we do is we put these into tests. So it's a standard uh, test module enclosure. So you define test. This is like defining a function that is used for testing. Um, it has this operator called is, which uh, is just a, like an assert, a kind of a fancy assert. So I could write a test here. I called it test tick. I can make two assertions in it. I can say if I evaluate clock zero and clock prime one, I, get, and, uh, I, I evaluate tick in that context, it should be true. And if I evaluate this other thing, it should not be true. So now I could build up a test suite that covers the different parts of the, the specification that I'm writing. And once I do that, I can run a suite of tests by evaluating this run test, and it, it tells me if they're, they're passing or failing. So that's a very familiar process to developers. And um, I think there's a lot of value in bringing that bear to, uh, to spec writing as well. So overall, I want to make this point that I'm, I'm promoting the use of tests, but um, I'm not promoting the use of tests to the exclusion of thinking deeply and carefully about our problems. <laughs> because that is, after all, what TLA Plus is all about. It's about getting us to really sharpen and refine our thinking. And so, um, uh, I think the cycle needs to be this. I think we need to think carefully. We need to design it. We need to you know, write up our specs or write up our code and then go and get feedback from the system uh, to find out where we're wrong. So the way I think of it is um, this is kind of my mental checklist I go through uh, when I'm kind of thinking about some code or like whether it works. Like the first thing is if I, if I write it, I, I, if I've never run it, I have no reason to think it works. I, I should not think it works. So, um, so the first thing is does it even compile? You know, does it even run? If I run it, does it blow up, or does it actually complete? Uh, if I give it some trivial input, does it give me the right answer? If it's an add function, does it add one and one? Does it give the answer for non-trivial input? And then finally, there's these tricky edge cases. And so for me, I think of this as like, it's different gears that I can drop down to, depending on how critical some code is, or how tricky some code is, or how confused I am, right? So if, thing, if I'm just running fast and loose, I might say, yeah, just you know, ship it. I don't even need to compile it. It'll probably work. But if, I'm really, if it's like really critical, I can like slow way down. It's like, OK, let's get back to the basics here. And let me just take it, you know, take it real slow. So um, I mention this because, like I said, I'm not promoting testing to the exclusion of thinking carefully. I want to do both. And I'm not saying we need to pervasively do, you know, test every little line, uh, but rather use it as a tool where appropriate and where, where it, it helps us. So that was evaluate. Uh, there's another operator you can use uh, in SALT. It's called simplify. Um, so this is kind of a similar, um, similar uh, signature here to the evaluate, but it, it brings in the source file name. So I'll talk about this a little bit later, but this is actually going to look at the source code rather than looking at you know, what's been evaluated in your closure REPL. So uh, you reference your source file name, again, your constants and your state, and then some expression. And it will then try to simplify that expression. So the key limitation of evaluate, like it was really powerful, right? Because I could just ask the closure evaluator to evaluate my spec, and it would give me an answer. 
But the, the limitation there was I had to specify every variable that was going to be referenced. Like it could only give me an answer if I told it all the variables. Whereas simplify, I can now give it some of the variables and it will try to simplify the resulting expression to, be, uh, to just tell me what the, the, result, the, the remaining variables need to be equal to. So if I go back to that example of the clock, um, I added the parameter to, to reference the clock. There's no constants. I say clock is zero and I ask it to tick. It's going to now you know, look through that code. It's like, oh, there's tick, and it calls this, and it's got this or, and it's got and, if you remember all that code. And it's going to try to apply, you know, think of it as just applying algebraic rules of simplification to try to apply rules to get it down uh, to a compact form. And so it does that, and it comes up with, oh, well, clock prime, uh, if clock prime, clock prime being equal to 1 is equivalent to tick being called in this context. Um, so clock prime equals 1 makes this expression true. Um, yeah, so if I call it with clock prime of zero, oh, so yeah, the simplification rule, like it doesn't really understand time. It doesn't know the prime variables come after the non-prime variables, so I can give it a prime variable. So I give it clock prime of zero, and I, I, I try to simplify tick, and it tells me, oh, that's equivalent to, um, you know, clock, or that will be true when clock is equal to one. Um, I can call simplification uh, I call simplify even when I have specified all the variables. So it kind of devolves into evaluation at this point. So it tries to simplify that and says, oh, well, that's actually equivalent to false. So that was simplify. Uh, simulate is very similar to simplify. Um, but again, the signature is the same as when we just saw. You pass in the source file, constant state. Uh, now you add in this in. So that's the number of simulations it's going to run. And what this is going to do is, uh, whereas the other one was kind of algebraically trying to analyze the code and like figure out what the, the minimal equivalence was, this one is going to, in a very crude way, try to uh, sort of randomly pick, not quite randomly, but try to resolve the non-determinism to identify values for the unbound variables that make the expression true. And it's going to try it uh, uh, however many times, n times, to do this. So here we say, okay, yeah, go run on clock. There's no constants. Here's my state and my variables. Run 100 times and call tick and see what you get. Um, so you have to be able to read closure, I guess, to read the result. But this is um, a set of maps where each map is um, a possible solution or a possible uh, set of bindings that make the expression true. So it, it ran 100 times and it found just one solution, which was if clock prime was one. So. What I'm trying to do is bring these tools I just showed you that give us the ability to interact in the REPL, to incrementally build things up, write tests, refactor. Um, I'm trying to bring those to bear on, on these parts of, of writing a spec. So then the final one, kind of the, the, money, the money item we need here is we need this operator that allows us to transpile uh, a salt specification into TLA+. So for this, all you have to do is give it the, the source file name, and then it will read that in, and it will emit um, TLA plus tokens or characters. So um, I, I closed out my specification here by adding the, the kind of standard spec indicator at the end, or spec uh, operator or whatever at the end. Um, and then if I called transpile on that, this is what it produces. So um, yeah, so to read that, uh, the slashes in closure are escaped, so it looks wrong. but. That caught my eye, but anyway. So if you transpile it, uh, that, that's what you get. So uh, there's that. So here's what's happening. Um, we write salt, we write this closure code, and then we're asking, uh, we, if you look at the path we're following to get to any of these operators, this is the path, these are the paths we're following. So first the closure reader reads it. And that's one of the real powers of a Lisp and closure is uh, you write your code as data, and so it can read in uh, your code and you kind of, you know, very easily at hand, you get, um, you get an abstract, abstract syntax tree in hand for, for your code. So the standard closure read, or standard reader, standard closure reader reads the salt text, turns it into closure data. At that point now, we can pass that closure data into a variety of our, our functions that we have. And this is kind of internally what it's doing. So if you want to evaluate it, then it actually just passes it to the closure evaluator. Um, so it just evaluates it as plain old closure code uh, with kind of the proper definitions in the salt lang module to, to make it do the right thing. Um, that's one path. And another path is, oh, take the closure data in and do all this manipulation to try to simplify it. And that's the, the simplify. Simulate, we saw, and then transpile, it takes the data in and, and just emits TLA plus text. So um, to me, this is, um, 
you know, this is a key, this really highlights a key of why we would be doing formal methods, is because it lets us mechanically manipulate the code that we're writing and, and trying to demonstrate that here. Some of these are very much just like token, like I was just exploring the space and just wanted to understand what we could do. So like our simulator, it's really basic. It doesn't really do much at all. But we were just trying to flesh out our understanding of the space and what, what could be done. So, um, yeah, hopefully I've shown how SALT kind of accomplishes or kind of meets our, our problem statement that I started out with. Um, Yeah, so uh, interactivity, uh, you go to closure, you get a REPL. So you can interactively write your SALT specifications. Uh, incremental coding, uh, we can write tests just like we normally would. Um, it turns out that you know, if you specify all the variables, you can just call your, um, your spec operators and uh, just see if they evaluate to what you think they do. Um, we've got support for, regret, uh, for refactoring, both um, because our editors understand closure code as a syntax tree, and so it makes it nice to change it. And then we've got, a, if we built up a regression test suite, we can reorganize our formulas and all and rerun the test and, and be confident, or at least find out if, if we broke things. Um, auto formatting, uh, the editors understand how to format the code, so I'm never like manually you know, tweaking everything. And um, it both, the auto formatter understands how to, uh, format the S expressions that make up closure and salt. And they also understand, uh, when I do transpile it, the transpiler emits kind of nicely formatted code. So I'm never manually formatting either TLA plus or, or salt. And then uh, the familiar syntax, this is leveraging, uh, you know, people that understand closure, this is leveraging, uh, you know, their investment in that. So, uh, this is my very crude diagram. This is mentally how I think of what, we're, what I'm doing, what we're doing with SALT here. And that is, uh, we're trying to bring developers to TLA+. Plus. Like, that's the goal, is to take them to the TLA+, plus concepts, to get them thinking in the way they need to for TLA+. Plus. And we're just scaffolding, right? So we're just, like, when the rocket launches, when you go to the model checker, all this SALT stuff just falls away. All you're left with is the, the, the spec and running through the model checker. Um, so... Um, you know, I don't want to be like, I want to be rigorous, I want to be thoughtful and make sure we're, we're getting all the semantics right. But at the end of the day, like, we're not going to make your rocket ship crash, right? That's on you. <laughs> like, like, your rocket ship, you need to make sure you understand what's in there and you need to run it through the model checker and make sure it works. So even if there's something that, like, where we messed up some of the semantics and we didn't do something quite right in SALT, uh, the, the expectation and the hope is that, that you'll be able to find that before you, before you launch. Um, obviously, we want to correct any issues that are there, but... Um, uh, I think this is part of defensiveness on my part because we're dealing with this domain where you're supposed to be like formally proving that what you did is correct. And what I'm saying is I don't have a formal proof that SALT is correct. So um, there you go. All right, so uh, back to my early slide about adoption. So what we're targeting with SALT is that whole ease of use. And the idea is, um, I know we talk a lot about you need to think above the code and you know this isn't code. And I, I think that's really important because we have to be thinking about the code. But once you're thinking about the code, the practices that you're bringing to bear to write a spec, if you're a developer, in particular if you're a closure developer, but if you're a developer, um, a lot of the skills that you need, you already have, right? It's a matter of, of harnessing those and getting a tool set that allows you to use those. So I think if we can make it more comfortable for developers to actually write specifications, we'll ease in the adoption uh, of uh, TLA+. And with a goal of getting us to thinking above the code, right? It's not an end in itself, it's to get us to that place where we can do TLA+. Plus. So we've been using SALT, uh, we use it successfully to write TLA plus specs, it meets its objectives as I laid them out. Um, we're able to interactively write specs, and it, it's a very comforting feeling, right? Like early on I would use the toolbox without this, and I'd be like writing and writing and writing, and I, yeah, maybe when I say writing, maybe it took me 20 minutes, right? But it still feels like a long time without feedback. And eventually I like go to run it, and it's like, oh, did it work? And if it didn't, like, well, where is my mistake in all this? Um, and that just makes me very uncomfortable with the way my, I'm used to doing uh, interactive development. And so using this, um, sort of my personal endorsement here, using this, I go through my iterative cycle here with Salt, and when I go to the toolbox, I, I'm confident. Like I, like I know what's in there, I know how it works, I've, I've, I've debugged things, and now I'm just looking for you know, the big payoff of letting it do the, you know, search the behavior space and, and tell me if any of my uh, temporal invariants are violated. Um, so this is my disclaimer. You know, th there's many ways, uh, it's an experimental thing, it's not a finished product. So there's all kinds of um, things we just haven't been able to take on yet. Um, 
But we did open source it, so uh, it's up on the internet. Uh, feel free to take a look. Uh, we'd love to hear feedback if anyone you know, tries to take it for a drive and tries to actually do something with it. So that's what I had. I think we have time for questions. Thanks. Last question. Thanks. That was that was really cool. I okay, really cool. love your Thank talk. You. The um, I was kind of trying to reconcile the. You were talking about the simulate uh, kind of command. Yep. And I was trying to think about where it fits within the kind of objectives that you set out for yourself. And I was thinking like, well, that, that kind of looks like model checking. <laughs> so that it, you know. So what was your? I guess okay. I want to know how you found it useful. Why is it in there? You know, why didn't you use TLC to okay. do this potentially? Okay. Yeah. That makes. I understand. I think where you're coming from. So uh, the way I think of it is I'm trying to take on these things highlighted in yellow. And for me, the things highlighted in yellow includes actions. So what I want to check in SALT is that um, if you think of the, the whole state space, so if you've got this behavior running all along, I'm not worried about all the behavior. I'm worried about a step from this state to this state. So for me, that's all it's simulating. It's stimulating step to step, or step to in steps that it could go to. So it helps you debug the actions that you Exactly, define. yes. It helps you debug the actions stepwise, not trying to say things about the overall behavior. Yep, that's right. Yeah, so it's a, just a bit of automation, basically, to help you reach further out without manually writing 100 of them. Yeah, and, and truly, um, at this point, I think that I would say the simulator is only in there to flesh out our understanding of the space, of what you could do. Because we're, we're trying to like come to terms with, OK, you've got this. Now what, what do you do with it? What are the different approaches? Like, What would you do with it? And so we said, oh, you know what? We've got this simplifier. There's like a little tweak you can make to that to actually just have it go ahead and bind variables when it finds them that would make it true. And they're like, oh, yeah, let's try that. And so we did it. And they're like, there it is. OK. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time like, trying to make it really smart. It's really dumb, actually. And, uh, but um, that, that's why it's there. Next question. Um, so I was wondering, uh, what is the license? What's the contribution process? Um, have you thought about using core logic for that simulation step? And is there a salt AST? Okay, I'll try to get all this. Um, license. I'm trying to remember the license. It's very generous and very open. Okay. Um, contribution process, just open a pull request or something. There's nothing formal. Um, I remember the last one. Is there Salt AST? The one right before that was? CoreLogic. CoreLogic, yes. So I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I writing the Simplify thing? Like, there's, a, there's stuff to do that. And I went to reach for those, and I was in, unable to get one like, at hand easy to do. So. Um, I'm very confident that there's much better ways to do it than what is currently in there. <laughs> I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And so I would really view the whole thing as it was an experiment to explore the space to understand what we could do. Now we kind of like, oh, we understand the lay of the land. Now let's like be a little bit more rigorous here and let's focus on some areas. So that, that's the state that's at. And that's right at the top of my list of bringing in some uh, existing technology, whether it's like I don't even understand it well enough. Like is it unification? Is that what I want? Is it core logic? I'm not even sure. So I'm open to being educated on that. Um, and then on the AST, um, what did, like, so when you write salt, like, this, these are just lists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm think, so, like, closure turns into its map-based AST. Right? Oh, I see. Is no. there a, okay. No. It's just, you walk, the, we're walking the tree of lists. So it is, it's basically closures AST. Exactly. Great. Thanks. That's right. Yeah, so great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, are you using this to teach closure programmers TLA plus if they um, don't already know it? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is, so I've got a lot of closure, uh, closure developers at work. And so when this presentation goes up, that will be the starting point. But yeah, that's, that's what we're working towards. That's right. Great. So, so I'm guessing there are no materials, like reading materials for that just yet. But maybe those. I mean, what I have right now is up on, um, on the GitHub there. OK. Um, so what I've done is, uh, like, what I really need to do is I need to be able to have, like, this Rosetta Stone that maps, okay, this is what the closure looks like, this is what TLA Plus looks like. So there's this automated test suite that runs, 
and it will like spit out Markdown that goes up on GitHub to say, oh, here's the salt expressions, and here's the equivalent uh, TLA plus expressions. And then I really think of it as it's, I should have a picture, but like, okay, here's the salt, here's the TLA plus, this is what the salt evaluates to, and this is what the TLA plus evaluates to. And you should just kind of be able to um, set up equalities between those, so. All right. That's the docs I have so far. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yep. Hi. Yep. Are there ideas you would like to bring back to the TLA toolbox? So I think you've presented very interesting things here. And I'm wondering, could we ex like, are there ideas where you think this is something that you would like yeah, to bring back to that? Uh, I guess that's up to Marcus. <laughs> no, but uh, what, would you, what would you like to see in the TLA toolbox, for example, out of these things? Um, I mean, this whole experience that I described, like that's the experience I'm looking for. I'm sure there's other ways to get it. I'm, there's ways in Eclipse to get it, right? So in the toolbox, there, there's ways to uh, achieve this. So yes, yes. Um, one of the things, looking a little bit at Salt and the toolbox, my personal um, desire, I've been looking for where are the libraries in TLA toolbox? I mean, Clojure like, running on the JVM, I should be able to just import that as a library yeah. and then run the evaluation there. Um, and part of that's just my ignorance of the code base, but that would, like, yeah. if the people that are more familiar could point those parts out, that would be really, really cool. I, I've had similar thoughts where I thought, you know, I could probably just go pick up TLC real easily and just call it from right here, just say TLC or salt check or something like that, right? So similar, yeah. Next one. Okay, there are no more questions, and thanks again. Okay, my pleasure.